So now I'd like to set the scene by briefly talking about the gaps in the current management of growth disorders. My disclosures. And you start by seeing these two growth charts. On the left, a child, a girl, aged approximately eight years, has significant short stature. And you can see that her growth curve, the growth curve of her plotted heights, indicates that she is growing too slowly and her height is falling away from the centile lines. She could have growth hormone deficiency, Turner syndrome, small for gestational age, short stature, chronic renal insufficiency, or some other form of short stature. She may be an appropriate case for growth hormone therapy, which is indicated on the right. She starts growth hormone, she has excellent catch-up growth, and she, she reaches a normal height, and she has a good adult height. Now this growth curve shows the optimal management, and we are addressing the issue of growth disorders because long-term growth hormone therapy requires commitment by the patient, the family, and the healthcare professional. And these are some examples of children with specific growth disorders shown under each photograph and these are licensed for growth hormone therapy in some parts of the world, some licensed by the FDA in the US and some by the European Medicines Agency. And as you see, there is a wide range of growth disorders which are now licensed for growth hormone therapy. What are the aims of growth hormone therapy? Firstly, efficacy. We need to demonstrate catch-up growth, the child needs to be growing normally throughout childhood and through puberty. And we need to reach an adult height for the child which is close to the genetic target height. And we need to show efficacy in terms of increasing the serum IGF-1 level into the normal range. We need good adherence to therapy. We need safety with minimal adverse events and the growth hormone needs to be patient friendly. In other words, it needs to be well tolerated by the child. Finally, we need cost effectiveness and we need personalized growth hormone dosing using growth prediction models. Well, are we achieving these aims? These are historical data published in 2011 from the Nordic countries. And as you see on the bottom of the graph, the different types of growth disorder, idiopathic organic growth hormone deficiency, small for gestational age, idiopathic short stature, and Turner syndrome. And the definition of an adequate response to growth hormone is basically a change in height standard deviation score of more than 0.5 during the first year of growth hormone treatment. So if you have a change in height standard deviation score which is less than 0.5, and this is indicated by the green bars, this is essentially a poor response to growth hormone. And this is unsatisfactory. And you may be surprised to see that throughout these range of growth disorders, there are poor responders ranging from 28 to 56%. There are several reasons for poor response. Of course, the diagnosis may be incorrect. The dose of growth hormone may be incorrect. The dose of growth hormone may have been incorrectly individualized for the child and even the therapy may be incorrect. But poor response is very important to identify because a poor response means that there is no benefit to the child, 
and this is a needless use of expensive therapy. Now in this webinar we are going to concentrate on an important aspect of poor response and that relates to suboptimal adherence to the growth hormone regimen. You may be surprised but poor adherence to growth hormone therapy is common. Adherence is often suboptimal. Up to 82% of patients are shown to miss some injections. Up to 60% of patients may miss more than one dose per week. And finally, we now know that better adherence results in better growth. So the success of growth hormone therapy depends on the patient's ability to adhere to their growth hormone regimen.